Don't be telling me what to do. I know how to live my life. Well, hey, don't you tell us how to live our lives. What's up, guys? Hi, guys. You can tell us how to live our lives, Chad. Sorry. Not Drew and Chris. It's okay. We're, we're sellouts. I'm coming. Yeah. Sorry. Hey, Panda. How are you? Harley, do we still have the wrong title in our video? Huh. She's probably ignoring me. I mean, that's, I mean, I do too. That's fine. <laughs> but, uh, so what's up guys? Last time we ran a little over on, uh, what we are now calling TNT tactics, uh, fan community chosen. Uh, we put a straw poll in earlier this week and that's what you guys picked. So TNT tactics, it is, um, we, uh, we ran a little over last time. Uh, we were in the middle of talking about how to set up a horror setting for your home campaign or or work campaign. And, you know, we figured we'd finish uh, talking about that and then roll into some other cool stuff. Yeah. I spent too much time talking about Warhammer. I'm not afraid to <laughs> admit that. He gave me the stage. But, I mean, you've been asking for it for months. Right. So the big thing that we started hitting on last week and want to hit on kind of this week is uh like the difference between character fear and player fear that yep. was something that we'd start talking about last week and how you know here's some things to make sure that you do uh one of the great things about van richten's guide is it really goes into knowing what your players are and are not comfortable with absolutely uh for instance palmer does not like creepy dolls oh. but the carrion eds is a creepy doll. Yeah. So, me as a DM, I wouldn't want to throw that at my party if Palmer was in the party, which he is. Uh, I want to use the carrion. I really do. It looks fun. Sure. Whatever you say. That does not look fun to me at all. <laughs> but see, that's his reaction. So, doing something like that makes the player uncomfortable. If players are uncomfortable, they're not going to respond to... The situation no the way that they should in place of their characters absolutely no this is not the star trek stream sir uh i think it is it could be they have tabletop games live long and prosper oh kobe ash yeah so those are really the things that you need to try and keep in mind is the way van richten's guide puts it is consent are your players okay with this Absolutely. We're getting waved at off camera. Sorry, Go guys. Go away, Chris. That's right. You better leave. <laughs> so I'm a good person. It's fine. I won't say otherwise. <laughs> I would. <laughs> sure, plenty of other people would too. But yeah, so there's there needs to be a different like a good example of this is actually Chris. Um, in our campaign, when something happens that is scary and terrifying, I mean, Chris himself doesn't care. But Gamby uh, soils his brown pants and screams at the top of his lungs and red lines our audio. Every single time. And then passes out. And that's a distinction that you need to make. Like, Chris, the player, isn't afraid of the bag that's in game. Uh, one of his favorite, you know, you know, monsters out there is Slenderman. Absolutely. And this so. is 100% just... Hardcore like Slenderman. A loincloth, long, dirty hair Slenderman that lives in a bag under the sea. <laughs> may or may not be pineapple shaped. <laughs> uh, but so that's kind of the difference is finding where that line is. And it's one of those that it's always good for the DM to sit down and talk about stuff like that with their players. Maybe not necessarily giving away what they're trying to do, but, you know, just sit down with your players and be like, so Palmer, what are things that you would not want to see as a player in the campaign? What would actually bother you? Creepy dolls. And it's an easy conversation like that. And it's something that you can sit down and do like a round table discussion with, with your entire party. You can do one-on-one. -on -one. Whatever suits you, whatever suits them. So that's always something to keep in mind. 
Now, with that being said, um, Ravenloft is the book that we've been covering, Ben Richter's Guide. Um, but obviously, in our Planar Escapades stream, <laughs> we're not in Ravenloft. Right. We're in Innistrad. Mm -hmm. So what are some things that are similar in those two um, planes that kind of tie together, and what, what things are completely different as the DM? So as a DM, you've got a lot of the same monster versus people aspect. You have... It, Innistrad, as a set for magic, was all about traditional horror movie monsters. And that was even how Wizards had first introduced it. Yep. Was, we're bringing in good old-fashioned werewolves, vampires, and zombies, and humans, and that's it. Oh, here's yep. some angels, and here's some demons. Because you can't have all that other stuff without having demonic possession being a possibility. So, when it comes down to it, like, you can look at Innistrad and tell that they took some of their nods of that from Ravenloft. 100%. Absolutely. Because, like, there are so many things that feel I'm... like Ravenloft. So, like, there's a there's a mini, guys. Um, I don't know if our man behind the curtain can find it real quick and link it in the chat. Um, it's from the Curse of Strahd set, and it is Strahd. And if you had... A minis painter, like our, you know, resident dungeon master. Um, if you painted his hair white, hundred percent Soren. Oh, maybe Hampton might be able to pull it up. Yeah, I have access to. Assuming we've got the one screen. stock currently. Okay, so we have unpainted. Uh, that's. The Monster Menagerie. One. Oh, that is not the same one. Which, but, I mean... I mean, it's still close. Like, I can go ahead and show this off for our folks. Yeah. So, you know, here we have the traditional look of Strahd von Zarovich. Yeah. And then you come up here, we've got his mini from the Unhallowed series. Now, the one that Palmer was talking about that you could easily just take and paint, get an invisible Strahd von yep. Zarovich... And all you need to do is just go over it with some basic primer. Yep. And paint then it however you need paint it. it however you need. So, like you said, there's plenty white of different hair, artworks of Soren. Soren as well. So you can kind of flavor it however you need to. Mm -hmm. I kind of want to get this to yeah. paint him up as Zorn now. Thank you very much. I mean, you have a painting stream tonight, sir. I do. I've got Nahiri sitting at home. Hmm. I can't That's wait good. to work on her. What are you painting tonight? Uh, so, tonight I'm finishing up the Orc Mega Boss. Because uh, I am changing up the paint scheme a bit. I'm sticking with, like, the volcanic glass look. But instead of having white as the accent color, I'm going to go with, like, kind of a dingy gold. That's fair. Okay. Um, and if I get done with him tonight, guess what? Some of my favorite monsters now. Okay. Mains. Mains. Yep. Uh, okay. Okay. I blame that solely on Chris. <laughs> the and with Chris going bald yeah. And his beard ripped out. Uh, so... In character, guys. We wouldn't do that to him in real life. I mean, I Yes, might. we would. You so, have? Is that what you said? That I said I have? might. Oh, okay. I don't blame you. So, of course... main demons. These are the exact little boys I'm going to be painting up this evening if I get done with the Auric Mega Boss. Giving you guys a little sneak peek. Um, there's three to a pack. And I love this line of miniatures because there's just so many out there. We have... A bunch of them here in stock and like they're just great times super fun to work with and i mean come on who doesn't love just painting up their own favorite little monsters to throw at the party that's fair it's putting a little bit of yourself into the game yes i am going to paint your dragon miss harley q i was going to say i thought we talked about this and uh, once you finish the Orc Mega Boss, you're going to start painting that dragon. So, and it was going to be an Azure Rathalos theme, wasn't it? So, it is. Uh, I do need to pick up a few more paints before I get started on it. That's make right. sure I'm getting all the shades and everything right. Um, and I might possibly be getting a different set of primer for that. And okay. prime them silver. Go from there. Are we going to fight him in the campaign? Probably. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But anyway, um, something that is cool in Van Rickman's Guide, 
and we talked about this a little bit last time, is the Bagman, mm -hmm. um, which is Baggins in our campaign. Yeah. Um, my Bag of Devouring that I fed a demon to, and then Van Richten's Guide came out, and Hampton went, ooh, shenanigans. Okay, look, blame him. He's the one that sent me a picture of it. He was like, hey, you want to see something cool? Sure. Click. Oh. Thoughts and ideas. But, I mean, we have a mini for that now. Because you asked me to throw one out for you. Yeah, I, I do indeed. Yeah. So I've got to get do? him in gonna, an alcohol bath. Oh, yeah, yeah I, that's fair. I'm going to be that struggling resin, too. folks. A little rough sometimes. Yeah. But, uh, I digress. The, the point that I wanted to make is... In Van Richten's guide, the Bagman doesn't actually have a stat block. Yep. It's just, it's an urban legend that is there for DMs to use at their discretion. And it's not the only urban legend in oh, there no, either. Not even There's more. like three or four really good ones that you can use in a Ravenloft setting or literally any other one. Yep. So, it's... And it goes into detail on how you can even implement them. That's one oh, of the yeah, great yeah, things yeah. about it. And since since there is no stat block, if you decide to use it as in an encounter with your group, you can literally just make it up. It can be whatever uh, creature rating you need it to be. It can have whatever features you need it to be. But ultimately, it wants to pull things into its bag. It... It's okay. I have a template for Mimics. Of course you do. Of course he does. Favorite monster from Dark Souls? Mimics. My biggest complaint about the Dark Souls board game? No Mimic miniature. Yeah, but they have that nice little, like, cardboard uh, cutout. It's not even a cardboard cutout. It's a resource that you can go and print off online. <laughs> okay, so it's a piece of paper. I mean, that gets the point across, right? You got your little your little cutout mimic that's supposed to be like this tall or whatever. In comparison. Sorry. <laughs> I didn't mean to. Um, you can attach it to cardboard. You could. You could make it a standee. I could. But. I mean, with the rest of the miniatures in that game, though, that's kind of terrible. But, I mean, that, that about covers it right now for Ravenloft. If you guys want to hear more about it, you know, feel free to hit us up in the Discord. There's subclasses, there's lineages, because they're getting away from races. Yep. Um, those lineages are... Spot on. Cool. The Hexblood. Super good. Dompier. Yep. yep. Oh, my God. Dompier getting spider climb as a racial ability. Yeah, and at level three, you can just... You don't even need your hands to do it. You just walk up to... As Palmer had... Described it to me. Yeah. 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 And then if you're a soul knife, you can just throw psychic energy daggers at people while you're hanging upside down from the ceiling. <laughs> and they can't hit you. Because so, you have 60 foot range and your psychic daggers. So what you need to do is make this character, but give him a background as a circus actor. I have ideas, sir. Um... One of the Dompier um, racial um, choices is how you became a Dompier. Okay. So, just just for flavor, because the uh, apparently we're talking about it, but um, for flavor, you can pick whatever race you want. Yep. So, Tiefling. Mm -hmm. um, doesn't have to be a standard, you know, red skin Tiefling. You could go. Um, blue, like they have in the Menagerie Coast for the Explorers of Wild Mount stuff. Yeah. Or, I mean, uh, they, on Critical Role, even had one that was Lavender. Like, you, you've you got openings for it, and there's albino tieflings as well. Which is what I was leaning towards. But, imagine that this poor soul is on some kind of excavation, and he ends up in the Underdark. Mm -hmm. The Underdark is the home to the Illithids. One of the ways that you can get your Dompier powers is being implanted with a parasite. Huh? So, <laughs> imagine this albino tiefling. And drow, exactly. Imagine this albino tiefling. Um, yet to be named. Um, gets captured by Illithid. They decide to turn him into an Illithid because he is between... I think it's uh, 
five four and six two of a, of a certain build and humanoid. Um, so they implant it into his eye, mm -hmm. and then he unlocks his psychic powers, and he goes through life craving psychic energy, just like um, a normal illithid would. But for some reason, the process is halted. Maybe it's because getting the implant unlocked his psionics, and for some reason it's holding it off. But that could be your character's major fear, something triggering that change that will sh turn them into an illithid. And then you just run around. Um, I'm a wrestling fan, as you saw me on the wrestling podcast. But there's a wrestler named Orange Cassidy. Okay. So my albino tiefling dump here with his illithid hatchling in his head walks around and fights with his hands in his pockets. And he just summons psychic blades next to his head and whips them around as he needs them and fights from range. And that being said, he'll also just walk up the side of a wall and hang from a ceiling <laughs> And just and win, in theory, probably die first fight. But I mean, it's definitely an interesting concept. And I'd probably throw it out this second I got in the game. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be realistic here. But sorry, guys, didn't mean to go out on a tangent with uh, theory crafting for characters. Also, something cool to look into would be a Dompier Way of Mercy monk. We'll, we'll talk about it in another time. But um, this brings us back to Warhammer, because that doesn't match this. Right. But where we're at here is right there. Oh, we get to talk about it. Yeah, Woo. absolutely. Hampton's been kind of excited about this, guys. I'm always excited. That's, that's my superpower. So <laughs> what we have your here. Your superpower was you're a cripple and you always hurt. That's my other superpower. Okay, that's fair. But speaking of non-superpower things, we have today Warhammer Underworlds Beast Grave. Now Ooh. I know that's a mouthful. Absolutely. Uh, Warhammer Underworlds is one of the small scale skirmish games that Games Workshop does. Now, this particular set is a two-player starter set that is set between I'm gonna have to turn it around here because I can't oh, remember no. the name of these war bands. It's like Sylvaneth and goat boys not their actual name they're beast men it's canon now you said it uh but it is gashrax to spoilers and scathe's wild hunt those are also mouthful sir it's warhammer <laughs> okay look at least it's not like the 18 letter long uh commander that's coming out for magic with modern horizons 2. oh 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 i i know yeah yeah I, I've seen people already saying that they're going to house rule it at their game shop, that if you can say that name perfectly without stumbling, you can summon it for free. I mean, that might be a little too much, but I, I respect the hustle. Always respect the hustle. Oh, yeah. But this right here gives you everything you need that you need to be able to start playing this. It gives you two war bands. It gives you dice to share between you and whoever you're playing against. It gives you two boards each board has two sides to it and you can line them up more or less how you want okay so your terrain can be different each time yep That's nice. it gives like you that. uh different terrain markers for like impassable or deadly okay uh it gives you so many objective markers it's like up to nine so for well, bigger games especially whenever yeah. you get into like 4v4 i was gonna say because Th this itself is a two-player starter set yep type of thing but can you put this together with one of the other, what did you say, there's three of them? Uh, or do they all have different rules and you would have to do it with this one specifically? So the good thing is that the way these works, uh, it's been a long day. <laughs> uh, Beast Grave is essentially season three of Warhammer Underworlds. Right. So there were two seasons before this. There was Shakespeare, yep. which was the original. And then, uh, I can't remember the other one. It's How one dare you forget Warhammer stuff? We gave you 13 jobs and you couldn't remember one of them. <laughs> Go figure. Today has been a long week. It has. But Beast Grave was season three. The most recent one is Dire Chasm. Is that one out yet? Did you figure uh, that one out? So Dire Chasm came out this past August. Okay. So we're getting ready to go into season five. So if you're going into season five. Yeah. But the good thing is all of the previous seasons, warbands, boards, all of it can still be used 
in like competitive play moving forward. The only thing that really ever changes is what ability and power cards and equipment cards get banned. Like any TCG, there's a ban list that gets updated every year. So whichever one comes out this year, you wouldn't want to play this against it because this one's going to be significantly more powerful. Not necessarily. Okay. So certain uh, powers and equipment from the older seasons are definitely very powerful. But given what they had at the time, like you look at some of the stuff from season one, half the cards from that are either banned or restricted to one. Okay. And it's mostly because compared to, you know, what we have now with like Beast Grave and Dire Chasm, there's just been a dynamic shift in the meta. And it's like magic in that regard. The meta changes every year. And especially with like Commander, Modern, all right. that there's always going to be shifts on things that can and can't be used. For instance, uh, I know me and Logan talked about this uh, last week on Troll vs. Toad. Yep. For instance, uh, Copter, uh, whatever it is. It's the one of the Thopters from Kaladesh. Smuggler's Copter? That one yep. is banned. Just permabanned in everything. Why? Because... I don't know. I don't know new magic. Because I know old reasons. Magic. Reasons. Uh, because it's really good. It's really OP. And if you combo it with like two other cards, you just win. So Sorry. you kind of have that same thing with Beast Grave. Uh, Beast Grave kind of blurs the line where it's strictly a miniature war game and a card game because there's a deck builder aspect to it. Each war band has their own deck. Yeah. Um, but the good thing is, rather than having to drop upwards of hundreds or thousands or thousands of dollars on a single army you drop like 40 bucks to get a warband mm -hmm. that warband will never change right it's always going to be those same models for that warband that's that's fair but is this competitive in regular warhammer so gameplay the neat thing with this is that there's a different tournament scene for, like, Underworlds versus standard Warhammer. The great thing about the Warbands that you see in Underworlds, they are usable with whatever army they're meant to go with in okay. standard Age of Sigmar. Okay. So, like, if I was running Beast of Chaos, I could totally run Gashrax the Spoilers. Nice. And they're their own unit. They're all, like, different named characters. They have, like, their own special stats and everything. And, yeah, there may be something that's exactly like them in the army already. But in that it regard, has different stats. yeah, they have some slightly different stats and a couple extra abilities. Nice. So they're unique. But that being said, if you take them, you can't change anything about them. They come exactly how they're meant to be. So you can't add any relics and make them a smash captain. Right. Lame. Okay, making a smash captain in Age <laughs> of Sigmar, so much harder than it is in 40k. But you can still do it. Yeah. How do you do it? Carefully. Oh, that's fair. So, and of course, Beast of Chaos, Goat Boys, they really like sacrificing each other and or themselves to summon demonically possessed minotaurs. Wave after wave of their own dead body until they win. More or less. I like it. Uh, in the case of the Scathe's Wild Hunt, they are tree folk. They're like traditional fairies, fae, okay. tree folk. Uh, if you look at the whole Sylvaneth army as a whole, some of their biggest models are just straight up trees. <laughs> They've got trance. Even the trees walk in these games. Yeah. Uh -huh. So. All right. So, so if you can take the models mm -hmm. and you can put it into your standard war band. Yep. Or your standard army. What is the difference in typical Warhammer gameplay as opposed to this? So as far as turn structure goes, uh, in Age of Sigmar, you have what's called the priority roll. Every right. round you roll at the start of that round to see who goes first in that round. So basically initiative. Yeah. Each round. Yeah. Okay. But that's solely in Age of Sigmar. 40k doesn't have it. it. So in the case of Age of Sigmar, it can lead to, say for instance, me and you are playing. Okay. We're playing. I go first, and then you oh, go you, second. You were going to explain it to me. I sorry. I thought you just want me to say say it. No. Okay. So... In that regard, like, if I went first, you went second, right. we would roll, and it's entirely possible that you win that initiative roll. For sure. 
and whoever goes first in the round automatically wins ties on the die roll, essentially to prevent, you know, the person that goes second in the round, but then has a chance to go immediately again. It's called the double turn mechanic, right. is what it's popularly referred to. Makes and sense. that double turn by itself makes it so that it's a lot harder to plan out, but it can make the tide of the game completely change. So it's a really cool mechanic. Underworlds doesn't have that. Well, so, it kind of does. Uh, it's weird. So Beast Grave is Age of Sigmar style minis, though. It's yeah. the sword and sorcery, not the futuristic yeah. chainsaw cannons. So if that is the case, why doesn't it have that same mechanic? So it does and it doesn't. What? So each round, you take turns until I think it's... You're going to have to forgive me. It's been a few months since I played. Never. I'll never be forgiven. Nope. Can't do it. But it's like four activations for each player in a round. And you just go back and forth until you're done. And then round ends. You go on to the next round. And at that point, you roll initiative again. Yep. So it is entirely possible that you'll get initiative for that round. But we still do the whole going back and forth on activations. So in the case of like Underworlds, an activation is you move one model, yeah, that so activation's it's done. Turn based tactics. Huh? Yeah. Instead exactly. of just move your whole army because it's your turn. Right. Okay. So it allows for a more dynamic gameplay and it's feasible to do that because it's a smaller scale game. Like to give you an example, each of the war bands in this, in like standard Age of Sigmar, would be along the lines of sixty to a hundred points is just like a ballpark estimate but so like maybe a tenth or a fifth of your army depending on the size of your army right but in this points don't matter okay so if i thought that we should give this away yeah what would you suggest the spam word be uh goats goats yep goats you hear that chat we're gonna go ahead and give this away the keyword's going to be goats. Keyword goats. Um, I mean, there's a big old goat boy right there in the center. So that makes sense. Um, now, chat, make sure that you are following so mm -hmm. that you can win. Any subs get double entries. Oh, yeah. Um, if you want to drop your prime sub to get those double entries, feel free to do so. Um, that is your choice. Um, this box right now is up for sale on the website if uh, our man behind the curtain wants to find that as well and link it if anybody's interested in looking at it some more while we're doing this giveaway. But while we're waiting to roll that, let's switch gears a little bit. Okay. There was a new Unearthed Arcana that came out. Yes. Yeah. So for anyone that doesn't know, back in the day, Unearthed Arcana was its own book. Absolutely. And it was just... A bunch of the crazy stuff that was off the wall and there were a few different versions of it the last one that came out in 3.5 was called the tome of magic <laughs> a person shouldn't be able to solo a tarask and win but you can at level 15 but you can you should uh, one of the videos that i was watching the other day by the way um kind of a digression here but you brought it up um Instead of a dragonborn, what if what if it was a Taraskborn? You seem perplexed. Not so much perplexed. I just want <laughs> to make it happen now. That's fair. I mean, you have the capability of doing so. You run a campaign. I do. But the thing is, I want to play this character. <laughs> That's fair. Anyway, uh, do you care to go ahead and... Pull up this on our Arcana for us. Uh, if I can find my mouse. I've lost myself. Uh, it's on the other one. Uh, I don't have the other one. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, chat. Give us a second. Hampton is navigating his way. Oh, look. He found it. Did I? I'm blind. It's up. Up. Aha. Here we go. 
All right, so taking us off the prize cam, bringing you back to my screen. Mages of Strixhaven. Now, this is one of those that Palmer sent it to me yesterday. He was like, what do you think about this? And, of course, I looked at it. I was like, are we going to talk about this tomorrow? Because I'm down for it. So, uh, so the great thing about Mages of Strixhaven is that this, in case nobody knows, there's a Strixhaven book coming out later this year. Yep, Thank no, you, Amazon, um, for spoiling that. November, yep. And... I believe this is some of the playtest content that's supposed to it be shown up in that is, yeah. book. 100%. Uh, and that's what Unearthed Arcana is now. They go ahead and put out playtest material for people, the masses, to, you know, actually use it, give them their feedback, and then, lo and behold. Yeah, so Van Richten's Guide to Ravenloft also had one of these. It was called Gothic Lineages, yeah. and it, it went over the, the dump here. The, uh, the Hexblood and the Reborn in pre-testing phases. And some of the things that you could end up doing with Dump here were absolutely bonkers because their uh, their teeth count as a natural weapon and a simple melee weapon. Ooh. So you can Divine Smite with them. So in the, in the playtest content, um, the description for the Vampiric Bite of the Dump here was you regain hit points equal to the damage that you deal with the attack. Smabite? Yes. So you Divine Smite. You you have a 1d4, but it's also affected by a martial arts die. So if if you're a monk paladin... Floria blows pair. with your teeth? Yep. So you get your... You can... You roll your, your uh, teeth damage, right? Right. And then you Divine Smite, and then you add all of that damage together... And that's the amount of health that you can heal or add to your next attack roll or ability check. So not only does that work with Divine Smite, but it works with a crit. Why can't we have nice so, things? So if you double your damage on a Monk Die Smite Bite, you just heal all the damage. But there's also a, an interesting synergy with one of the Bard subclasses. Um, it's the one with the... Blade Flourish. Yeah. Um, if you deal melee weapon damage with your teeth, with your teeth, te oh my god, your teeth count as a melee weapon, you can deal the same damage to every enemy within five feet of you. So, it just, it gets crazy. When, when the book actually came out, they changed it to piercing damage. So you just take the piercer feet and deal extra damage instead. That's probably for the best that they change that. Let's go ahead and be honest here. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the next book that's coming out is... Um, it's it's a Fey book. I forget the name of it. Oh, the Feywild. Yeah, it's, it's a Feywild book, but I, I forget the official name for it. But the Unearthed Arcana before this one was races for that. Um, so you had like Rabbit Folk, Owl Folk. And uh, I don't remember what the other one was, but it, it ended up being really cool. And that stuff was tweaked and then put into the book. And now we're here, which Strixhaven was the last main magic set that came out. Modern Horizons comes out next week. Um, and in this, it gives you a bunch of different options for casters. So if you can... Aha, uh -huh, here we go. Yep. So, the way Strixhaven worked is it's it's Harry Potter magic, basically, guys. Essentially, except, you know, Liliana's Lil totally got oh. that uh, librarian look yep. that I enjoy. Yep. Um, Professor Liliana. But uh, in Strixhaven, you had different colleges, which were your... It was your guild equivalent. It was your your color combos and stuff. So, with this, what they've done... Is, is similar to the Gothic lineages where instead of your class actually mattering for what subclass you can take, two or three different caster subclasses can take the same college as their subclass. So I took the time to read over it, and it's literally all the caster classes with the exception of Cleric and Paladin. Yep. Which is kind of... Uh, not necessarily. Well, I mean, you don't you don't have anything for artificer in there either. Like your your right. half casters don't 
having to, I mean, I guess Bard could be a half caster and Bard has stuff in here, but. And Druid is also a half caster and a divine caster at that. <laughs> That's where I have my problem. Yeah, but there's absolutely nothing in here for anything martial related except for the Bard. And there's nothing in here for a cleric either. Maybe because religion doesn't exist in Strixhaven because it's all knowledge and science and stuff. I guess in that regard, in the case of cleric and paladin, they're getting their magic from a divine being yeah. rather than manipulating they, they the not, natural forces. They, they even just in may the not case, have that in Yeah, and even in the case of druids, they draw upon nature itself, not necessarily yeah. any particular deity. Yeah, absolutely. Now, that being said, they do have warlock subclasses, which is not necessarily a divine being, but it could be. So it actually does cover uh, that in this, in that okay. rather than going through like a supernatural entity as your patron, the college is your patron. Yeah. Uh, it's essentially the college is what's granting you your power. Uh, now, in the case of if you do something to break oaths, I don't know how you would necessarily. You become an Oathbreaker Paladin and rule the world. What? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but uh, it's one of those that it, that's probably more at DM's discretion on, for instance, if a warlock forsakes their patron, how that affects them if they're from one of the colleges of Strixhaven. Right. So, and in in this, it says if you gain a feature from your subclass that lines up with a normal feature of your class, you have to pick. You don't get both. Yeah. Which, that can be kind of rough depending on what it is, but... It's a balancing act, though. Yeah. Um, that, that's one of the things that will probably change. They'll just probably better even out when you get stuff. Yeah. But you do have colleges for each of the different groups in Strixhaven. So, of course, you have Lorehold, Prismari, Quandrix, Silver Quill, and Witherbloom. Each of the colleges do their own things. They represent different colors in magic. Yep. Um, I believe the colleges themselves are supposed to be like, uh, Lorehold's like blue, isn't it? Or white? Logan, are you in the chat? Answer this question. He's not here. It figures. Uh, <laughs> all I know is that Witherbloom is like green-black. Yeah. Because they're all about death, decay, and yeah. demons. Yep. Um, metal. Metal. So, looking at what they can do, Lorehold. Now, this is one of those that, if you wanted to do, like, a summoner-type build, oh, yeah. this is probably it. Absolutely. This is the one that gives you the... Um, the ancient the companion. companion. Yeah. Um, this, this subclass is available to Bard, Warlock, and Wizard. So, Kelly could play a Warlock. I could play a Bard. And Hampton could play a wizard, which all have different mechanics, and then all still have the same subclass. Yep. Which is... I, I honestly don't know how I feel. I mean, I guess it's pretty cool on one level, because you can all... Like, that could be your group mechanic. Like, you're all from the College of Warhold. Yeah. Um, a good way to play it off at that point is... Of course, it's supposed to be like Harry Potter. So yep. if you look at, you know, the kids in Gryffindor... All of them are really good friends, typically. Griffin dorks. Yeah, Griffin dorks. Um, Hell Hydra. I mean, Slytherin. <laughs> and so, of course, everyone would get, like, this ancient companion. Yeah. So, looking at it from a DM's perspective, I could feasibly throw higher challenge rating enemies at you guys. Yeah, because everybody's going to have a different companion. Uh, you would have different companions, and then, of course a better action economy for yep. you guys. So that's where you kind of mm -hmm. have to balance it out, especially if you get a bunch of players that are like, we're all going, you know, Mage Vlor hold. Mm -hmm. And no, we with, take the warrior ancient companion. We each have our own personal tank. Pretty much. Now, the great thing about this particular subclass is that it's not so much about you as it is about making your companion better. Yep. It's, you animate a statue. You bring yeah, it to life. It's, it's a straight-up pet class. Yeah. And pet classes are finally starting to get the attention they need after well, yeah, years I mean, of being bad. If if you look at traditional hunter rangers or beastmaster rangers, they're, they're not good. They're really not. Like, Tasha's, Tasha's did a wonderful thing with updating it with the beast spirits instead. Mm -hmm. But they're still not really great. I think the the best build that actually has a companion in it um, other than this stuff, obviously. Um, 
uh, Battlemaster Artificer. Yeah. Where they get the um, the faithful hound companion that they can use on their turn to block attacks and stuff. Good old Morning Kynan's faithful watchdog. Basically. Doesn't one, someone in the party have a scroll of Morning Kynan's faithful watchdog? They do. Okay. I'm going to have to make that disappear. <laughs> but, like, so I want to go ahead and point out not all of these subclasses actually give extra spells. Because not? not all of them do. So, in the case of, like, Lorehold, you get a bunch of, like, just good toolbox spells. Right. With, and like, you get Sacred Flame and Comprehend Languages as cantrips at first level. Yeah. And then, of course, like, Knock, Locate Objects, Speak with Dead. Arcane Eye, Stone Shape, Legend Lore are all really good toolbox spells. And then you have Spirit Guardians wave. and Ooh. Destructive Wave. Yeah, Turns that's... out Spirit Guardians... Mm. Spirit Guardians is nasty. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. So it's more you're there to help your construct while it handles a lot of stuff for you. Now you can look at this thing stat line for the Ancient Companion. Yeah, it's, yeah, it, it's, it's, right. it's not great. But that's where the different types come in. Because plus in the past, you get, you essentially choose healer, sage, or warrior. Yeah. And that's where, yeah, that's where your guardian the companions or your start companion getting gets their um, subclass, basically. And like each of your, you know, subclass abilities that you get is, again, further building on that. Absolutely. So. It ends up being ridiculously good. Oh yeah, because like you, you get your companion, and then you get the specialization for your companion, and then you get what's called history's whims. Yeah. Now this one is really good because I don't want to say that it's kind of OP, but at the same time, it's kind of OP. Well, like, look, you receive brief flashes of the future, stealing yourself against oncoming attacks. Whenever you make a saving throw against an effect that deals damage, you can roll a d6 and add the number rolled to the total. And it's whenever you make a saving throw. Yeah. Just outright. You can. like, So you don't have to if it's something that you purposely want to fail, but yeah. it, you just get it. And now, see, Does the, it say anything in there about like proficiency times a day or anything? So benefit lasts until you start your next turn. You cannot choose the same benefit two rounds in a row. But you can absolutely just be like, oh, look, resistance, yep. look, swiftness. Look. Now, the thing is, once you use the feature, you can't use it again until you finish a long rest unless or you expend a spell slot of fourth level, level or higher. Which, okay, that balances it out. That's actually good. a really good trade-off yeah. there. So that really helps out. Um, now, Prismari, I looked at this, and my first thought was monk, multi-classed, with either a druid, a sorcerer, or a wizard. And having, you know, good old-fashioned 120-foot dashes as a bonus action. Yeah, just um, turning into a, into a lightning bolt and electrify yourself through enemies without provoking attacks yeah. of opportunity, and then punching them in the spine. So that's the great thing about this. Like, you can look at it, and it says nothing here about getting bonus spells. From... Um... Scroll. So, using the subclass, uh, gain two features: creative skills and kinetic artistry. Oh, yeah. yeah. Not all of them are about spells. Okay. So, in this case, this is essentially the martial aspect. Yeah. Uh, like you were mentioning, um, not necessarily for a martial class, but it allows you to take a new aspect about like druid sorcerer or wizard you could actually make a frontline fighter out of a character like this and it's mostly because they can kite around so yeah. easily so and of course gain proficiency in two of the following skills of your choice with acrobatics athletics nature or performance oh uh, good. good some better than the others yeah um Kinetic Listen, artistry. That kinetic artistry is where it starts getting really interesting. Dash has a bonus action, and when you take the bonus action, choose one of the following additional effects. Now, it's either you have ice and cold water following you, and you slow people if they fail a strength check against your spell save DC. 
Uh, flames, they're also not prone. Flames, though. Uh, yeah. Flames wreath your steps. Once before the end of your turn, you can force each creature within five feet of you to make a dex saving throw against your spell save. Now, Lost. there's there's an important thing here. It doesn't specify that you can name which ones have to make the save. It's just anything. If you decide to use the feature, it's anything that was within five feet of your movement. So, which includes your party. Yeah. The thing with all of these is that it is entirely possible that you can hit your party with friendly fire. So yep. if you're going to dash around like you're a Dragon Ball Z character. I probably would. Uh, so would I. Uh, Burly. It's fair. Way of the Sun Soul. That's what I was going to say. Sun Soul uh, Prismari. Yeah. yeah. 100%. Do full strength build. Yep. <laughs> oh. Oh. But more yeah. theory crafting on how to build Broly. <laughs> oh, we're, D &D. we're gonna break off into theory crafting a lot, guys. We're trying not to. Yeah. I promise. Oh, we're rolling. Oh, rolling. Bronze, Bronze Panda. Panda. You won the giveaway. You have won Beast Grave. Congratulations, my dude. I hope you enjoy it. It's definitely a good way to dip your toes into Warhammer. And honestly, even if you find that Warhammer's not really your thing. There's some sick minis in here that if you put them together and you get them painted up would be killer for, for a tabletop D &D, game. Yep. For anything. Absolutely. 100%. So congratulations, Bronze Panda. Uh, I think we've got your information, so we'll send that out to you tomorrow. Yep. So Anyway, after the Scorching World, though, uh, Thunderlight Thunder Light Jones. You take on a nimble lightning form. Until the end of your turn, you can move through the space of other creatures and you do not provoke opportunity attacks. If you end your turn inside a creature space, you are pushed to the nearest unoccupied space. But, important thing here, um, that will come up in another one of these subclasses. You don't take damage from that, even if you end your movement in mm -hmm. the same square. Now, of course, where it balances out here is you can only use it equal to your proficiency bonus. And yeah, you don't get any more rest. uses until yeah. long rest. So, that's the trade-off. Yeah. And... With Prismari, it's all about improving your elemental damage. Yep. Uh, what you do additionally on spells, your dash getting better, your attacks themselves getting better. So it's just, it's really good in general. Now, all of these have like something like this impeccable physicality, where it's uh, whenever you make like, in this case, a dex saving throw, you can treat a d20 roll of 9 or lower as 10. Taking 10 on everything. Yeah, literally, you can't roll below a 10 unless you fumble. Yeah, so that's, that's literally a, the only time. That's a high-level rogue feature, isn't it? Or is that a, is that a straight-up feat? Uh, I want to say that's a straight-up feat. That's fair. Uh, it might be a rogue feature. I, I don't rogue. You should. Rogues are fun. But uh, another cool one that we glossed over here, uh, focused expression. Um, you own your talents further, and basically, depending on which one you pick, you just add a d6 of damage type whenever you deal damage. Yep, and that's to... Let's see. Uh... Determined by damage type with your favorite medium. Yeah, so it... Oh, so, yeah, that one is where it can just go straight into your attacks. Yep. It just happens. Yeah. So, like, it's, again, one of those really good bonuses, mm -hmm. and it allows these hard casters like Sorcerer or Wizard to be able to get on the front line and deal decent damage with a melee weapon. Yep. This does say uh, once per turn when you deal damage to at least one target. Yep. So you could, once per turn, this activates. Like it does, as long as you've hit something. But only one of those creatures is going to take that extra damage. Oh, yeah. So it's it's really cool, in my opinion, but it's not super overpowered or anything like that. Oh, yeah. So, of course, next we have the Major Quandrix. Now, this is strictly Sorcerer and Wizard. And these, the, these guys... These are smart boys. Yeah, they're all about math. <laughs> I ain't about the math. No. no. Um, so... Math magic. <laughs> Mathic? Math magician. Oh, no. So, of course, we've got our bonus spells for this. And it's, again, all in the form of enhancements 
and uh, detrimental effects. It's more toolbox spells. It, that's a lot of what these guys have because, like, enlarge, reduce, spike growth, or of vitality, haste. Haste. All about that haste. Haste on a uh, Prismari monk. Yeah. There you go. 240 feet dash. <laughs> Let's do it. <laughs> then give him a. Oh, God. What is the spell? Dimension door at the end of it? <laughs> For another 500 feet? Come out, just go in at Mach 10, splat against the wall, dies. Yeah. That's my luck. <laughs> so, of course, that's what you're looking at. Now, their big thing is fluctuations or functions of probability. Now, for anyone that knows what Bard does, inspiration die. Yep. Uh, supplemental function. You have that. Which is and, interesting, because this isn't one that you can pick as a bard. I guess I didn't want to double up on the inspiration dice. I, that's exactly why. And my thing is, if you did have a bard in the party that was like, well, I'm going to use bardic inspiration on this character, mm -hmm. and then your Quandrix mage is like, I want to use supplemental function on that same character. Yep. Stacks. Now, as a DM, the way I would rule it is, you can totally do that, but you have to pick one die or the other. You can't use both. That's fair. Simply because... It's like, oh, I rolled a two. Hang on. Oh, I got an eight on that D8 roll. Oh, I got a six on that D6 roll. <laughs> there we go. Yep. I'm hitting on a 16 from a two. Yep. Plus, you know, your proficiency bonus and all that. I mean, so you're hitting that, over 20. That's not necessarily overpowered, though, because you've just burned both of those buffs. You burn both of those buffs, but at the same time, it's like you have a Vorpal Sword. Maybe. Or you're a paladin with smite. Maybe. And you really need that smite Maybe. against this demon. Maybe you're a paladin with a vorpal sword. Paladin with a vorpal sword. Smite. Yeah. So. Seems fine. <laughs> Sir. You can tell who has the DM experience here. Sir. <laughs> so, and of course, diminishing function. Use that on your enemy. If they fail their wisdom saving throw, then they have to roll a d6, subtract the number rolled from their next attack roll before the start of your next turn. <laughs> so it's honestly a really good way to screw so, with the enemy, make life easier for your team. So this is Bardic Inspiration and Vicious Mock. Yeah. Nice. I'm a wizard. So this is basically like a full caster bard. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And then, of course... It's more of a lot of the same stuff that you've been seeing. Uh, these guys are all about just manipulating the way battle is going. Uh, null equation. Through careful calculations, you beset your enemies with abstract equations that reduce their might. Once per turn, immediately after dealing damage to a creature, you can force them to make a con saving throw against your spell save DC. On a failure, creature has disadvantage on strength and dex saving throws, and its weapon attacks only deal half damage. Which is pretty legit. Yeah. Now, quantum tunneling is where it uh, it comes back to the uh, the the lightning dash. Yeah. Because it's it's similar because you can force your way like you give yourself resistance to basic bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, and you can force your way through spaces. Like they're like a creature's just difficult terrain, but you take a d10 of force damage when you do it for each five feet that you move. While you're inside another creature yep. object. Yep. And if you end your turn inside a creature or an object, you are shunted. Okay. So if you're fighting a Tarrasque, and you end <laughs> halfway in the middle of it, I don't know why you would do this. Raising. Huh. And and your, your tunneling ends. Huh. You just... Huh. To the nearest unoccupied space. Now, for anyone that doesn't know, a Tarrasque is big. Very, very big. Very. So, a normal character can maybe, on like just their normal movement, get halfway through a Tarrasque. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> That's fine. It'll be alright. Now, I'm, I'm not super big on... The Mage of Silver Quill? I'm, I mean, I'm not big on the Quandrix Mage either. Oh, yeah, fair. Um, Silver Quill is, like, bard bard. 
But ink, ink, I mean, Inky Shroud is really good, though. I, it really is. Uh, but to me, this was really the only one, like, it and Silvery Barbs were the only ones that really stood out to me. So, now, of course, Eloquent Apprentice, uh, you learn one cantrip of your choice, either Sacred Flame or Vicious Mockery. Both decent options. Yep. Uh, additionally, you gain proficient in either Deception, Intimidation, Performance, Persuasion, or Insight. All good. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, you, you've got that going for you. Silvery Barbs. You can invoke words laced with magic to demoralize your foe and turn their misfortune into a boon to bolster your allies. Immediately after a creature you see within 60 feet of you succeeds on an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw, you can use your reaction to demoralize the creature, unless the creature is immune to being charmed. It rolls, re-rolls the d20 and must use the lower roll. If the attack roll, ability check, or saving throw then fails, you can choose a different creature with you see in 60 feet. And keep in mind, you can choose yourself. Yep. Even though you can't see yourself. Yep. Now, the interesting thing with this one, um, while I'm reading it back, I don't see any kind of roll that you have to make. There this, is this no is, roll for this. This is a level one ability that forces somebody to re-roll if they can be tar charmed. There's, there's no saving throw against it. It just happens. So if your opponent can be charmed, it just works. Yep. Now, the creature uh, that gets empowered can reroll one attack roll, ability check, or saving throw it makes within one minute and use the higher result. That's ten rounds. Yeah. So that's for most of a battle. Yep. Um, but only one creature can have that buff on them at a time. That's fine, because if... Your silvery bard succeeds, you just do it to somebody else. Yep. So, now once a creature fails an attack roll, ability check, or saving throw because of a reroll forced by this feature, you can't use the feature again until you finish a long rest, unless you expend a spell slot to use it again. That's any spell slot, though. Yeah. So, at first level, I think you've got three first level spell slots. Yep. So, it's one of those that you can keep doing it until they fail. Yep. So... Is this available to Warlock? So, this class. while you it is. ask, yeah, Bard, Wizard, and Warlock. So, you just short rest. You got your spell slots back. Yeah. Right. And it's super easy to use it. So, and let's be honest, what do Warlocks really need to use? There's two Eldritch spells Blast. that they need to focus on. Eldritch Blast. Hunger of Hadar. Hunger of Hadar. And Inky Shroud. And Inky Shroud. It's not a spell, though. I mean, so you're not wrong. Now, that being said, you learn darkness as part of that. So, there you go. <laughs> uh, if you're a wizard, you add it to your spell book if it's and not there already. The the important part about this is you can cast it without expending a spell slot. Yeah, once per day. Which and, is always or, good. Does it say long rest on there? Uh, You can cast a spell normally without uh, additional effects using... Long rest. Yep. Yeah. Um, but this is a miniature, uh, I guess it's not a miniature Hunger of Hadar. This is a 2d10 if you walk into it and end your turn in it. If you yep. start your turn in there, or and you end your turn in there, you take 2d10 damage. It's, yeah. It's nasty. Yeah. So you're talking a free Hunger of Hadar. Yeah, essentially. Hunger of Hadar is like 4d6, but, so, you're not going to get quite the max damage no but and it's not it's difficult close, terrain though. but yeah, yeah. no it, it's still a really good just as a freebie ability yep that's not bad um now infusion of eloquence this is really nice because whenever you cast a spell that deals damage you can evoke additional words of power to change the spell's damage type and any creature damaged by the spell takes extra damage equal to your proficiency bonus and has its emotions swayed with despair or adoration based on the damage type. So you can either, if you use Psychic, make them frightened of you or charm them. Either one is really good. Absolutely. And at a high enough level, that's extra damage. Extra damage is always good. And then, of course, Word of Power. Uh... Deadly Despair, when the target of your Silvery Barbs fails an attack roll, ability check, or is saving throw because of the reroll, you can invoke a Word of Despair to give your target vulnerability to one damage type. So, 
I don't remember what uh, vulnerability is right off the top of my head, but I want to say it's double damage. I think it is. So it's like everyone in your party is using long swords, slashing. Hey, you're now weak to slashing damage. Oh, no. Or in the case of Homer. What? You're being such a generous man. I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't do anything. Don't let him lie to you, chat. I know what he did. I didn't do it. So, it's one of those that it can, you can use that as a way to strip resistances on, say, demons, for instance. Yep. Uh, you want them to have vulnerability to fire. It takes their invulnerability yep. away. absolutely. So, there you go. That would help out this gentleman so much with his fireball <laughs> that he has to rely on for damage. <laughs> now, of course, this brings us to our last subclass, Mage of Witherbloom. I... I like Witherbloom. I do too. Uh, so, of course, Druid and Warlock only. That's fine. But uh, whenever you select it, you get two features, uh, Witherbloom spells and Essence Trap. So, back to having bonus spells. Um, as far as your choices uh, or what you get, Lesser Restoration, Ray of Enfeeblement, Revivify, Vampiric Touch, Blight, Greater Restoration... I think you guys are getting the hint. They're all about helping and harming. Good job, Chris. Not necessarily in that order. Chris, sir, you don't have a budget to cover a new car? Listen, four is his new low, though. Usually it's at least eight. That's fair. That is very fair. But yeah, I mean, all of these spells are actually really good. And obviously oh, yeah. they are life and death. Yeah, and that's kind of the whole thing about... Witherbloom, they are a lot about life and death, as you just said. You'll build a new car, uh, sir. You might need Legos for that. You don't have that many Legos. So It's got enough about a tire, though. Yeah, probably. You can just roll a tire to work. Yeah, that's fine. So, of course, Essence Tab. Uh, this is your other level one as a bonus action, you draw on a reservoir of life essence to empower yourself for a minute or until you use the feature again. For the duration, you gain one of the following effects of your choice, which is either overgrowth or withering strike. So overgrowth, when you choose the benefit as a bonus action on subsequent turns, while the benefit lasts, you can expend and roll one hit die. You regain a number of hit points equal to the number rolled plus your spellcasting ability modifier. Yeah, but withering strike. I mean, if a bunch of mains are jumping on you, trying to rip you to pieces, or just make you go bald and make you lose HP at the same time. I. But Withering Strike. So, okay, we'll go on to Withering Strike, because this is honestly pretty legit. When you deal damage, you can change the damage type to Necrotic, and you ignore resistance to Necrotic damage. Yeah. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that, but that, again, that's, all that's you still need, really though. good. And then you can use the feature a number of times equal to proficiency and regain all uses when you expend a long rest. Now, you'll notice with any of the other subclasses that have had the you get it back after a long rest, there's the caveat of or you can expend a certain level of spell slot to get it back. And yes, that was a call out to Gamby, sir. Um, in this case, both of those abilities are super strong so oh, yeah. it's so kind like, of reasonable that you can't really expend a spell slot to get it back now i does warlock get fireball um they do not or an equivalent big area damage spell hunger of hadar okay <laughs> but that's already necrotic isn't it or is it force uh it's necrotic and cold okay so, so you can essence t essence tap withering strike it becomes all necrotic, but you ignore resistance. Yeah. So everything in there takes full damage. Oh, yeah. Doesn't matter what it is. Or if you have something that is weak to necrotic specifically. Yep. And, for instance, you're a druid, and you use a flaming orb. Or your Eldritch Blast. Eldritch Blast. Anything that you need can become necrotic damage. Likewise, Neat. if something's on top of you, you know, beating you to death, and you're like, I really don't want to roll a new character. I like this one. 
get that HP back. Yep. Gamby could totally use that whenever he's fighting mains. Oh, too bad Gamby's a bard. Oof. Sir? Sir! So, of course, Wither Bloom Brew. This one's a little underwhelming to me. I mean, it's, it's got good effects. I just. It's definitely it if you want to do an alchemist kind of build. Yeah. Um, so, you gain proficiency with herbalism kits if you don't already have it. When you finish a long rest, you can use an herbalism kit and a pot or cauldron to create magical brews. You create a number of brews equal to your proficiency bonus, and they take their own flask, and they're good for 24 hours. So, this is where Wither Bloom starts going into the support aspect. <coughs> uh, excuse me. So, creating the brew for fortifying, choose a damage type from the following list, and it's hitting pretty much all the major elemental, as well as, like, radiant and necrotic. A uh, creature that drinks this or administers it to another creature as an action the recipient gains resistance to the chosen damage type for one hour. So think about it this way. That's one hour. Yep. That is 100 rounds yep. of combat. Yep. Even um, if you're not in the same fight, you've got but, it for one fight, you come up to another fight 10 minutes later. So the, the reason that this seems underwhelming to me is because it doesn't grow as you level up. It's the, it's the level... Six ability, right? Right. But it doesn't get better at level 10. It doesn't get better at 14. It just is what it is at level 6. Right. So, like, it's got decent effects in it. And, I mean, I guess the growth comes in with how many brews that you can make because it goes up with your proficiency bonus. Right. But that maxes out at 6. So, and while that is the case, your brews don't get any stronger. Now, on the offhand to that, you're saying underwhelming. I just read over quickening. It's a health potion. Yeah, 2d6 health 2D6. Yeah. That also, uh, let's see, one disease or condition from the following list. So, and it's the brew user's choice. So, charm, frighten, paralyze, poison, or stun. Yep. So, like, in this case, that's really good. Uh, toxifying. Uh, Martial weapon poison for an additional 2d6 poison damage. Okay, so I know how I can sell this to you. Okay, sell it. So, you multi-class Warlock and sure. Rogue. Sure. Go Assassin build for Rogue. I don't like Assassin. You already lost me. You know what I like. I already told you. Yeah, you wanted to be the big Catman Paladin. Yep. Or a Soul Knife. Or a Soul Knife. Okay, here you go. <laughs> here you go. Your soul like, knife. Yep. You're eating your knives. Yep. Apply the poison to a knife. But it's a psychic creation, sir. How would the DM rule that? Since it leaves no mark and disappears as soon as it hits. So, <laughs> you're psychic, right? Sure. Now, if you could explain a decent enough reason as to why your character would be able to attach, say, a vial that could be broken to this knife that's fair it's a psychic creation you can literally just have the blade form around it yeet the blade at the dude that's true it's it just says as long as you can form the weapon in a free hand i guess you could be holding the vial and make the blade and then yeet the blade with the vial inside of it i guess i mean that's how I i'm interested <laughs> but not an assassin Okay, it's too that's generic. Right. While you're right, it is the rogue, rogue, warlock assassin. I mean, yeah. It's yeah. not like you're I, a hexblade assassin. I mean, the hexblade is also super generic. Wow. Just talking smack about my favorite warlock subclass. Have you read some of these other warlock classes, sir? I, I don't mean, think that you have. I've been reading uh, the stuff that we've been talking about here. That's fair. And so even even with all of this stuff, I would actually probably Hexblade? take Wither Bloom over Hexblade. Have you have you read Undying? Oh, the yes. So, sir, <laughs> they're they're legit. They're very legit. Uh, the zombie lock, sir. 
So, uh, of course, Wither Bloom Adept. Your connection to the flow of life force deepens once per turn when you deal necrotic damage. There's a period there. I didn't pause. Yep. Um, when you deal necrotic damage or restore hit points using a spell, one target of the spell takes additional damage or regains additional HP equal to your proficiency. Don't forget, Kelly, Chris hears voices in his head all the time, so he probably does always hear chat. Now, for Wither Bloom Adept, if you remember back to your, what was it, the level one ability? Yeah. That's literally every turn. So, not necessarily. Because in this case, this is not a spell. This is just a bonus action ability you right. can do. When you deal damage, you can change the damage type to necrotic. Or you can heal yourself. True. And then the Wither Bloom Adept says when you deal necrotic damage or you heal health, you get the bonus. So, of course, say for instance, you've got that Flaming Orb or Hunger of Hadar going. Yep. You're adding your uh, proficiency bonus to all that damage. Yep. So, but important one target. For yeah. The spell. So, so you could completely ruin one person's day, or potentially heal all of their health. Is oh yeah. Because the connection to the flow of life force deepens once per turn when you deal or regain hit points. Question. If I use a quickening brew on Chris's character, okay, does my Wither Bloom Adept take effect for him, or would it only count if somebody else used it on me? Neither. So lame. Because again, you're empowering a potion. It's not a spell. True, but I'm regaining hit points. But again, and it it doesn't restore no, it hit does points using a spell. Using a yeah. spell. Okay, so when you deal necrotic damage or restore hit points using a spell, rules as written, is it any necrotic damage or does it have to be a spell? Rules as intended, I guarantee it's using a spell. It's using the spell. I believe that is the rules as intended as I would see it. Um, it's one of those things that Players are going to complain about it. It would be like every evening sure. for Game B. I don't know what the difference would be. So that'll be something that Wizards will probably clarify whenever the book actually comes out. That's a good question. So in the case of permanency, uh, this is actually a really good question to ask. Permanency is one of those things as a spell has kind of always been either enjoyed or frowned upon mostly because for instance druids <laughs> back in 3.5 could not use any form of metal yeah no so what you do is you get some really nice wood uh i you think getting... some of the choices were like blackthorn uh iron wood stuff like that you would take uh get it in the shape of a weapon uh i don't remember the exact spell you would cast on it but essentially made it as hard as steel yep and then you would cast permanency on it yeah. Make it permanent. Absolutely. Uh, you could do the same with armor, and that's how a lot of druids got around it. But that's one of those things that permanency is a ritual type spell, so it's going to take a while to cast it. It's going to take a lot in physical resources to cast it. Now, this is this is a strange question, probably okay. with an easy answer. For for a spell like permanency, which is not super high on on the spell levels you cast it as a ritual spell and you don't need to use a spell slot does your spell casting level still have to equal whatever spell slot you would be casting for the ritual spell or if you're a wizard do you just have to have it in your book like if if i'm playing a wizard and mm -hmm. we kill the big bad evil guy and he's got a spell tome that has that in there as a ritual spell can I copy it into my book and then cast it even though I may not have the ability to cast that spell? So, at that point, the way I would rule it, if you're copying it straight out of another tome, it would probably take you a while to research oh, absolutely, and yeah. figure out exactly how to I make wanna, it work. I want to say it's two hours and 50 gold per spell level. Yeah. And at that point, I would say, yes, you would totally be able to, but you have to take the subsequent time to transcribe it if you're transcribing it into your own spell book. Right. Uh, the time to actually comprehend how it works because right. it may not be in Draconic. Typically, most spell books are in Draconic, but if you get it from Big Bad Demon Man, 
why is he going to take the time to write it in Draconic when he can just write it in Abyssal or right. Infernal in yeah. the case of Devils? That's fair. So, or Phyrexian. Or Phyrexian. Uh, right. Praise be to Yawgmoth. Sir. Sir, <laughs> bring me that planar gate. I mean, I can work on it. I think it's a spell. Uh, yeah. So, praise be to Yawgmoth. Uh, for the last of the Witherbloom abilities. Withering Vortex. It, it's pretty good. Oh, yeah. So, I'll let you cover this one. I've been talking okay. about it. When you use a spell using a spell slot that deals necrotic damage to any number of creatures that aren't undead or constructs, choose one of the creatures that took damage. You drain an amount of life energy equal to half the damage dealt to the chosen creature. One creature other than yourself that you can see within 30 feet of you regains the number of hit points equal to the life energy drained. So, Hunger of Hadar. Yep. Um, is this the one with the vulnerability? No, that was a different class. But... You, you use your spell and your, your level 1 bonus action, you can make it necrotic. So at level 14, once per turn, when you use a spell, you can just heal somebody that's within 30 feet of you for half the damage that you dealt. Oh, yeah. So if you have something that deals a booty load of damage and your tank is on his last legs, he can suddenly be back up over half. I can see it now. Which Druid, ben could have this. Call Lightning. Oh, yeah. Does like not even max damage. No. And is going to heal someone for like 30 points of damage. Yeah, exactly. Uh, you can use this feature a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and you regain expended uses from the finish line. Yeah, so, I mean, with the combination of other things that are in this, Witherbloom's probably my favorite subclass that's in this. Now, I don't particularly care to play Druid very often. It's not my favorite. I think it's. As far as the other character options go, kind of underwhelming. Now, with that being the case, with what Witherbloom brings to the table, would it be enough to interest you in trying Druid? Probably. Because it has more spell slots than the Warlock. Now, Warlock always casts at its highest possible level. But, right. And it gets it back on short rest. But it, it gets you out of, like, I'm a circle of the moon, and I'm ultra tank, uh, infinite bear boy. But at the same time, if you're taking this as your subclass, that's cutting out a lot of stuff you have to worry about as a druid. Yeah. Because now, some of the stuff that is considered, like, the standard for druids is no longer there. Oh, my God, where's the mouse? There it is. Oh. So, it's definitely one of oh, those yeah. where this is bringing a lot to the table, and... It's one of those that anytime you're going to use something like this, especially with Unearthed Arcana, or if your players say, hey, I want to try this out, make sure you look over it. Oh, yeah, because uh, these Unearthed Arcanas have, like, they go through this playtest phase with so many players because they are broken. Like, the designers know that they've got something in there that somebody's going to view, like, like the thing with the Vampiric Bite for Dom Pier when it was in the Unearthed Arcana where you regained whatever damage you dealt. And if you were a blade flourish bard slash smiting paladin and you hit everything around you with divine smite damage for 40 each and then suddenly you regained 160 hit points or you you can add a plus 160 on your next attack or um, ability check. Woo! And think about this. Like, you could carry rats in your bag. And use a vampiric bite on them before the start of combat or before a big ability check. Like if you if you're trying to persuade the big bad evil guy to like murder himself or change his ways or whatever, you just pull out a rat and divine smite bite it and get plus forty two on your You're not you when you're hungry. <laughs> Snap into a rat. Yeah, basically. I mean th I mean that's why they changed it. Now it's just piercing damage. I mean, that's probably for the best. I mean, but if you're a monk, you get the monk die. Man. It really counts as a monk weapon. Because it's a simple weapon. It's not heavy. It's not two-handed. And natural weapons count for smiting. So you can still be a monk, take the, uh, the piercer feet, get a crit, do like 60, 10 damage. And then add that to your next ability check. And then persuade the bad guy that he's a good guy now. 
And that is how to <laughs> derail a campaign so hard that the DM is like, rocks fall and people die. Yeah, I, I have to ask Hampton a lot of things before I actually do it in-game because that's how my mind works. Now, that being said, I do a lot of the same things with the... You know, oh, why is he so much like he wants to break the game? I don't want to break the game. I want to enjoy the game, and I enjoy the game by pushing the DM's frustrations. I was going to say you enjoy the game by pushing the limits of what characters same can thing. do and what they should do. That, that is also fair. But this also means that, like a Minotaur, they have they have their charge, their bull rush, and yep. they have the hammering horns, where yep. they deal damage with their horns after a rush, and you throw your opponent. With the errata that got added to Paladins, you can smite with oh. your horns, too. So you can charge as a Minotaur with no, with no weapons, hit, smite, and throw. So what I need to see happen at some point is... Even if it's just a gag character, I yep. want a Minotaur Paladin, but mm -hmm. whenever he goes to smite with his horns, I want him to turn on, like, headlights. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Hi. Uh, well, guys, um, thank you for joining us today. We have, again, run a little over on our time, because Hampton needs to get ready for uh, a happy little orcs. Hello. Um, so, uh, next time, I'm not sure. Uh, we'll, we'll talk about it, and we'll... If you guys have feedback for us uh, about stuff that you want us to cover, we do have some board games sitting over here in the corner that we'd like to do some unboxing videos for in the future. Um, if there's anything specific that you'd like us to unbox or talk about, hit us up in the Discord or shoot the uh, Troll and Toad admin there a message on Discord. Or on Discord, on Twitch. Um, again, uh, Happy Little Orcs is coming up here in about 30 minutes. Uh, Hampton probably go grab him a little snack and a juice box. So he's yeah, not juice box. Um, tomorrow we've got Magic with Logan. Or is Jeremy going to be back? Magic with Logan? Okay, so Logan will be handling uh, Magic tomorrow. You guys are getting to see a lot of that boy this week. Oh, yeah. He's he's going to be on every show. Um, and for the Yu-Gi-Oh! Super Show, we're going to make sure that Logan is hosting that as well. Um, nothing on Saturday. And then we'll be right back into our normal rotation. Um, starting with the wrestling show, episode three, I believe, since we had one, the first one a yeah. couple weeks ago. On Monday, Tuesday, nothing yet. Yes. Um, Wednesday, Poke Shop, standard Logan with Kelly. Uh -huh. And then back into the rotation. So, have we figured out what exactly we're doing with Troll vs. Toad yet? I've not um, gotten the straight of that. So, I believe we did a straw poll last week um where it was decided that the community wanted us to do video games and earlier today i i wasn't in the chat most of the time but i believe that chris and logan had a conversation with chat about what games that they want us to play and they decided that you're gonna play um just dance 2017. Yep, they chose some games today. So if okay, Kelly, the look get on together. Kelly's face right now is priceless. <laughs> if 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 you can get the list of games together for us and post that in the Discord, and we'll figure out which one we're going to do first, since we're doing multiple games, we'll probably do one each week. Um, Halo, Dragon Ball, Xeno first, some basketball or football game, and Need for Speed. So I guess you get out of dancing. You guys don't want to see a cripple dance. Yes, they do. Don't lie, but. We'll figure out which order that we're going to do that, and then we will run that next Thursday. No dancing game. Oh, that's fair. I didn't think about music copyright. Ah, uh, yeah. That's fair. Thunderfist. Anyway, God. guys, thank you for joining us. Um, I'm your Smash Captain Palmer. Uh, this is the Resident Dungeon Master, Hampton. And we'll see you next time. Ah, uh, I have the buttons.